An exotic bird is any non-native species that is introduced to an area either intentionally or accidentally. So now that you know what an exotic bird is, let me go over a few of the things that I'm going to be talking about this evening about exotic birds in South Florida. You may be wondering what exotic birds are found in South Florida. You may be wondering where do these birds come from? Or where in South Florida can these birds be found? You may also be wondering how did South Florida become so exotic rich? And if you were not aware of how exotic rich South Florida is, you're about to find out. You may also be wondering if any of these exotic birds have any kind of negative impacts, whether it be on native bird species or other kinds of negative impacts. I'll talk about that. And finally, you may be wondering, are there any of South Florida's exotic birds that are in danger of disappearing? I'll talk a little bit about that at the very end of the presentation. So there are over 200 exotic bird species that have been reported here in the state of Florida. Breeding of exotic birds has been confirmed for at least 30 species. And it's also suspected for another 30 to 35 species. So this is a map of Florida. Uh, this map I copied from um, an excellent book called Florida Bird Species, an annotated list. And this map shows exotic birds by county in Florida. There is 67 counties in Florida. And as you can see from the map, there is a black dot in each of the 67 counties. But some of the dots are bigger than others. So the bigger the dot, the more exotic birds are found in that county. So if you look at Southeast Florida, you're going to notice that that's where the highest exotic bird diversity can be found. Miami-Dade County has had 142 different species of exotic birds that have been reported in the county. In Broward County, it's 80 species. And in Palm Beach County, it's 58 species. So those three counties by far have more exotic birds that have been seen there than in any of the other counties in Florida. So exotic birds are an attraction for visiting birders. And these exotic birds are a major part of the reason why South Florida has become one of the top birding destinations in the United States. So lots of birders come to South Florida from other parts of the United States and other parts of the world. They have to fly here. They have to stay in hotels. They have to rent cars. They have to eat in restaurants. This is all pre-pandemic, of course. Though you'd be surprised, there are still a lot of visiting birders that are coming to South Florida in spite of the pandemic. So, they're spending money here and they're contributing to the economy. So birds are a very important part of South Florida's economy and exotic birds are part of that equation. So when people come to South Florida, there has to be a way for them to find the exotic birds. They can try to find the birds on their own or they can hire a local guide. What I decided to do a few years ago is to start uh, my own exotics tour 
for Tropical Audubon Society. So I call it the South Florida Exotics Tour, and it's an annual full day van tour led by local bird guide Paul Bithorn and me. This is Paul, and this is me. So we take participants to various exotic hotspots throughout Miami-Dade. And typically anywhere from 20 to 25 exotic bird species are possible on the tour. Now you may remember from the previous slide that Miami-Dade has had 142 different exotic bird species seen in the county. So why is it only possible to see 20 to 25 exotic birds on a tour? Well, most of those 142 species have maybe only, only been seen once or twice. Most of them are escape pets that someone reports and quite probably no one else sees. So there's only a handful of birds that have become established enough as exotics here in South Florida that you, they're reliable in terms of being able to see them. So I'm talking about birds like these. These are blue and yellow macaws. If you're, if you're familiar with this bird from the pet industry, blue and yellow macaw in the pet industry is called blue and gold macaw. So I'll be using some interchangeable names for the birds. Birders call some exotic birds with one name and the pet industry sometimes uses another name. So I'll try to remember to give you both names for some of the different birds when they differ. So these blue and yellow macaws, um, they can be seen in a variety of places in, in uh, Miami-Dade County, but one of the most reliable places to see them are at the home of uh, a resident of Coral Gables by the name of Daria Feinstein. So Daria is a um, parrot owner, but she's also become a parrot advocate. So she's opened up her home to birders uh, in particular for our tour. And we go to her house, not only to see her pet parrots, but also the wild blue and yellow macaws that she attracts to her home using walnuts. So at the end of this presentation, you'll see more about Daria and her uh, parrots, both captive parrots, pet parrots, and wild parrots. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to give you a virtual tour of some of the more uh, reliable exotic birds to see in South Florida. And I'm going to start with the parrots. So the first parrot I'm going to talk about is the monk parakeet. In the pet trade, these are known as Quaker parrots. So this is a very common and widespread species here in South Florida. It's also been introduced in other parts of North America in New York, uh, Chicago, a variety of places. And it's become so established that um, the population is now considered to be almost um, a, a native species. So when exotic species become established, there's an organization called the American Birding Association, and they have produced a checklist for the area, which is called the ABA or American Birding Association area, basically the United States and Canada. And there are a lot of birders that are interested in whether or not the ABA considers an exotic bird to be countable or not countable. So if you are one of these people that the ABA list is important, 
I've included the um, logo of the American Birding Association for all of the species that are ABA countable. So monk parakeet is ABA countable. You may be wondering where monk parakeets come from. So I've included a map of its native range. So you can see that monk parakeets are found in Southern South America, Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, where it actually gets cold in the winter, just like it does in much of North America. So that is part of the reason why monk parakeets do so well, not only here in Florida, but also in places like New York and Chicago, where it gets cold in the wintertime, because they're used to it in their native habitat. Now, monk parakeets are very, very common now here in South Florida. So for each of the species that I'm going to be talking about in my virtual tour, I'm going to include a South Florida range map. This range map comes from Cornell University's eBird site. And I'm only going to show you where monk parakeets have been photographed in South Florida, and those photographs have been submitted to eBird. So you can see that monk parakeets have been photographed virtually everywhere in Southeast Florida, but they're also seen in uh, Southwest Florida and even in the Keys. And occasionally they even will show up in the Everglades. So for each species that I talk about today, I'll show you a picture of the bird, the name of the bird, name in English, and its scientific name. If you see that ABA symbol, that means it's ABA countable. You'll see its native range and its range here in South Florida. Next parakeet I want to talk about is the white wing parakeet. This is a parakeet in the Bertigeris family, small parakeet. By the way, what all parakeets have in common is a long tail. So if it's a parakeet, it'll have a long tail. When I get to the parrots, those have a short tail. So that's the basic difference between a parakeet and a parrot. You can see that white winged parakeets are ABA countable. You can see where they're from, pretty much just around the Amazon River in South America. And you can see that in South Florida, they're primarily found in Miami-Dade and in Broward County. And they're becoming harder and harder to find. There's a, a relatively reliable location just south of Miami International Airport. We refer to it as the Ocean Bank. It's a shopping center that includes that bank. And there are canary date palms on that property where these parakeets like to roost. So birders know that and they'll go to the Ocean Bank building, usually either early in the morning or late in the afternoon, to see if they can see these white-winged parakeets. White-winged parakeet used to be called canary-winged parakeet, and so was this bird, the yellow chevron parakeet. They were once considered the same species, and then they were split. So now we have two species, white-winged parakeet, yellow chevron parakeet. This one's also ABA countable. Its range is in Southern South America. So south of the Amazon River, mostly in Brazil, but a little bit in Paraguay and Argentina. The main difference between the yellow chevron parakeet and the white wing parakeet is the white wing parakeet has yellow and white in the wings and yellow chevron only has yellow in the wings. So again, this is a very small parakeet they usually fly in uh, small flocks in uh, South Florida. Miami-Dade and Broward counties are both good places to look for canary wing or uh, yellow chevron parakeets. So places like Matheson Hammock, uh, Dadeland Mall, um, th throughout Kendall, 
are good areas to look for yellow chevron parakeets. This is a Nanday parakeet, beautiful parakeet, used to be known as black hooded parakeet. This is where it's from in South America. So a little bit in Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina. So another bird that's used to colder weather. And this is where it's found in South Florida. They're hard to find in Miami-Dade. They're easier to find in Broward County and much easier to find in Palm Beach County. They're sometimes seen on the West Coast in the Fort Myers area, and they're sometimes seen in the Keys. Okay, now we're moving to parrots. See how it has a short tail? That's why it's a parrot. This is the red crown parrot, another ABA countable parrot. It's from Mexico, so it has a very small range in Mexico, but it's actually been introduced not only to South Florida, but it's also been introduced to South Texas and Southern California. So in South Texas, if you go to uh, Harlingen, Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, you have a good chance of seeing red crown parrots. If you go to Southern California, uh, around Los Angeles, Pasadena, Santa Anita, those are good places to see red crown parrots. In South Florida, they're really hard to find now in Miami-Dade. But if you go to places like Wilton Manors in Broward County or in West Palm Beach, you may see red crown parrots. This is going to be the last of the ABA countable parrots in my presentation. This is the green parakeet. So again, this has a longer tail. These birds are from Mexico and Northern Central America. In South Florida, uh, I've seen them in Miami Springs. Uh, they've been seen also in the Fort Lauderdale area. This is a very generic looking parrot. It's green. It really doesn't have very much in the way of field marks. So I have a feeling that this is a bird that's oftentimes misidentified. This bird has also been introduced to South Texas. If you go to the town of McAllen, Texas, also in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, in the early evening, if you go to the right place, you can see huge flocks of these green parakeets. They're much less common here in South Florida. Okay, let's talk more about parrots. This is the orange wing parrot. This is the probably the most common of our introduced parrots. So identified by the yellow cheeks and the blue around the eyes. And then it has a little bit of orange in the wing that's much more visible when you see the bird in flight. This is a bird from South America. In South Florida, it's found all along the Atlantic coast, common in Miami-Dade and, and Broward County, and a little less common in Palm Beach County. This is a lilac crown parrot. This is a bird from West Mexico. Not so common anymore in South Florida. Uh, used to be flocks of them in the South Miami area, around South Miami Hospital. They're not as seen as often anymore, only occasionally. And they're also seen sometimes in Palm Beach County. This is yellow crown parrot. This is also found in South America, and then it also extends into Central America, into Panama and Costa Rica. As you can see from the South Florida range map, this isn't seen very often anymore in South Florida. This is a tough one to find. You want to see this one, your best chance would be either Broward or Palm Beach County. This is turquoise fronted parrot. It used to be called blue crown parrot. And by the way, the pet name for all these parrots is Amazons. It comes from its genus name, Amazona. This is also a parrot from South America. And this is also another bird that's not often seen in South Florida. They're here, but they're here in very small numbers. And they've been seen in Miami-Dade and Broward and Palm Beach County. This is white-fronted parrot, another Amazon parrot. 
This one's found in Mexico and northern Central America, all the way to northern Costa Rica. This is another one that's a real tough one to find. They've been seen in the Coral Gables area. I think they've been seen recently around the Biltmore Hotel in Coral Gables, and they've also been seen in Fort Lauderdale, but this is a tough one. This is scaly-headed parrot. This is a parrot in the Pionis genus, and one of their um, field marks is the red undertail, if you can see that. This is also a bird that comes from South America, and it's been seen primarily in Coral Gables. I think that um, the University of Miami campus has been a somewhat reliable place for this particular species, but it's not reported often. So this is another tough one. Blue and yellow macaw. Okay, these are the largest of the parrots. So macaws are very large parrots with large tails. So they're larger than the Amazons and they have a long tail. So there are going to be two species I'm going to talk about. The blue and yellow macaw is from South America, Northern South America. Their range just barely extends into the Darien region of Panama. I've seen them there. In South Florida, really Miami-Dade is the only place that you can see this bird. I've seen them in Kendale Lakes where I live. They've flown over my house, but the uh, easiest, the most reliable place to see them are um, in Coral Gables. Uh, I've seen them often at A.D. Barnes Park. Uh, I've seen them quite often early in the morning um, along US-1. They seem to roost in the royal palms that uh, line uh, the median of US-1 and Coral Gables. They can also be seen at uh, Matheson Hammock, Fairchild Gardens, and of course, at Daria Feinstein's house, if you go on a tour. The other macaw is the chestnut-fronted macaw. It has a similar range to blue and yellow macaw. Um, the pet trade name for this one is severe macaw because of its species name, Severus. So I've seen this one in the Darien of Panama as well. If you wanna see it in South Florida, you can see it in Miami-Dade. Same kind of places that you can see um, the blue and yellow macaw. A really good place is Brewer Park, which is on um, Miller Drive, just west of 62nd Avenue. They're very reliable there. They're also found uh, at Fairchild Gardens and in the Miami Shores area. And they're also found in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Okay, we're gonna scale down now to some of the smaller parakeets or mid-sized parakeet. This is blue crown parakeet, very beautiful parakeet. You can see its range in South America. It has an interesting range in that it's split up. There are big gaps between the three areas in South America where they're found. Now, it's very possible that at one time, all of these areas were connected, but its range has now shrunk to the areas you see on this map. You wanna see a blue crown parakeet in South Florida. Miami-Dade is a good place, especially in the Miami Shores area. You can also see them in the Fort Lauderdale area. Evergreen Cemetery, which is actually a birding hotspot, is a good place to see blue crown parakeets. And then they're sometimes seen in West Palm Beach. This is mitered parakeet. This is the most common of the mid-sized parakeets that we have here in Miami-Dade. These are from, they have a very small range within the Andes in South America. And in South Florida, they're very, very common, especially in the Kendall area. If you go around Dadeland Mall, you can sometimes see hundreds of these parakeets. They're also found in uh, Broward County, and a few of them are seen in West Palm Beach. This is a very similar parakeet called the red mass parakeet. You can see that it has much more red in the face 
than the mitered parakeet. And it also has red in the bend of the wing. So that's an important thing to look for to make sure that it's a red mass and not a, a young mitered parakeet. Red mass parakeets are found in Ecuador and Peru. It's a coastal species in those two countries in South America. And in South Florida, um, they become pretty common in um, southern uh, Miami-Dade, uh, the Kendall area, the Pinecrest area, Coral Gables area. And they're also seen sometimes in um, Broward County. Very rarely are they seen in Palm Beach County. This is wide-eyed parakeet. If you look at the picture of this particular parakeet, you'll see that there is both red and yellow in the wings of this particular parakeet. So it's easier to identify this parakeet in flight sometimes than it is when it's perched in a tree. Here's where it found in its native range in South America. And here's where you can see them in South Florida. So uh, they're very common in Miami shores. I've seen them on Miami Beach. Uh, they can be found also in uh, Broward County, but not so often in Palm Beach County. This is crimson fronted parakeet. This one's found from Mexico down into Central America. The easiest place to find crimson fronted parakeet is in Miami Springs. It's been reported elsewhere, but we see this particular species of parrot most years uh, when we do our tours. It's a small parrot compared to the next species that I'm going to show you, which is called scarlet fronted parakeet. So it's very similar looking, but it's also much larger. So these parakeets are often found in mixed flocks. So if we get a mixed flock that has both crimson fronted and scarlet fronted parakeets, uh, we look for the larger birds and we know those are the scarlet fronted parakeets. These are native to uh, Western South America from Venezuela all the way down to Bolivia. And uh, as with the crimson fronted parakeet, Miami Springs is really the only reliable place to find this particular species of parrot. Rose ring parakeet used to be found in Miami Dade, but not so much anymore. This is a beautiful parakeet. And this is the only parakeet, uh, regularly occurring parakeet, um, that is from the old world. So the native range of rose ring parakeet is um, Southern Asia, primarily India, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if it wasn't for the pandemic, today I would be starting a birding tour in India. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that tour has been postponed until next year. So I have to wait another year be before seeing rose ring parakeets in their native range. But I have seen them here in South Florida. There used to be um, a very reliable population of them in the Naples area. They're also sometimes seen in the West Palm Beach area. And a year or two ago, there was one that was even seen in Flamingo in Everglades National Park. So that may have been an escaped pet. Someone may have brought the bird down into the Everglades and released it into the wild. So I don't know what happened to that bird. I wanna finish with the parrots by talking about um, three species that if you do see these in the wild here in South Florida, almost assuredly, they've been a recently escaped pet. So cockatiel is an example of that. This is a bird from Australia that is very popular as a pet bird and sometimes they escape, but they don't seem to do well here in South Florida. They probably end up getting eaten by some hawk or other predator, and so they don't last long. Budragar is also a very popular bird in the, the pet trade. It's also from Australia. 
This used to be an established species in Florida. Um, the established population was mostly in the Tampa Bay area, not here in South Florida. So if you see this particular bird in the wild, again, it's probably someone's pet that they just lost. Same thing with rosy faced lovebird. This is a bird that um, is found in its native range in Southern Africa, in Namibia and South Africa. And if you happen to see this bird uh, in the wild, like there was a couple of them that were seen a few weeks ago at A.D. Barnes Park, those were escaped pets. And they were only seen for a day maybe, and then who knows what happened to them. Okay, we're gonna pause here. So if um, anyone has questions, or if anyone has um, added questions to the chat, uh, I'll take some questions from Anna if she has any. Yes, I do, Ryan. I have some great questions here. Um, Alice asks, how long has it taken the parrots and parakeets to become established species here? Excellent question. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a timeline that's going to show uh, when different exotic species have been uh, introduced to South Florida. And in some cases, I'll give you a reason for how they were introduced to South Florida. So Alice, if you can wait a little while longer, I'll give you the answer to your question. Okay, I have another one for you. Are these parrots diminishing due to native um, natural causes or are they being poached? Uh, that's another excellent question that I'm going to be answering at the very end of this presentation. So uh, please wait for further discussion on that particular topic. Okay, and Any then- Any other questions? Yep. Um, what, um, let's see. What can we do to attract parrots to our feeders? Um, Joe asks. I live in a condominium, so I don't have feeders. So, um, I know that uh, I'm wondering if the Joe that's asking this question is our own Joe Barros. It and, is. Okay. It is. <laughs> so Joe has feeders um, that attract parakeets, in particular red mass parakeets. So maybe uh, Joe can um, text you, Anna, or put it in the chat, what he puts in his feeder that attracts all those parakeets. Okay. Let's see if we can get that information. Um, I think we're just about done with our questions. Let me see if there's any more in the uh, chats. Yes, I see another question from Sandra Reed. Are you still leading exotic tours in the winter? Well, the last exotic tour that I led was um, with Paul Bithorn was uh, this past February, just before the lockdown. So right now, Tropical Audubon is on hold with all of their field trips until it's deemed safe to start them up again. So once that happens, then we'll make a decision as to uh, if we'll offer another exotics trip, and if so, when that will be. So. I'm not sure if uh, it'll be safe to do so by February, but let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay, more questions here. Have military macaws been spotted in Florida? I believe that military macaw is on the list of birds that have been seen in Florida, but it almost assuredly, it was uh, a one-time sighting or maybe a couple of times. So almost certainly those were escape pets. And that is not a species that is known to breed in South Florida or uh, persist for a long period of time in South Florida. There haven't been multiple sightings of military macaw over a long period of time. 
Okay, we have, do the macaws here migrate? No, that's a really good question. Um, there's only one of the exotics that migrates and that'll be coming up in the second part of um, my presentation. None of the parrots migrate. All of the parrots that are established or near established in South Florida, they stay here year round. Any other questions? I'm just gonna check quick on the chat here. Um, okay, I think, I think that's all I have for now. However, if, oh, wait a minute, I do see one other one here. Um, I often see, uh, from Edith, I often see yellow and blue macaws on and around the Coral Gables UM campus. Is the red whiskered bulbul still seen in Kendall? It's a little Absolutely. off. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, and that'll be coming up in part two. Okay, great. And uh, one other question here. Do you, um, do you know which of the red-headed parrots, parakeets roost in the vents over at A plus mini storage at 67th Ave plus one? That's from <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Smith. <laughs> that, that is, it's, what is the address again? It is, a plus mini storage at 67th Ave and US one. It could be either mitered, probably it's mitered parakeet, but it also could be red mass parakeet. So that means that uh, you need to look for that red in the wing. Elizabeth, look for the red in the wing. Okay. And then Another few questions and then we'll move on to the next session section. Do we see any of the Cuban or Bohemian parrots? Uh, no, actually um, the uh, Cuban parrot, it's called the Cuban parrot in Cuba, it's called the Bahama parrot in the, ba in the Bahamas, but it's the same species. Um, that's that hasn't been introduced to South Florida and it's never shown up here as a vagrant at least that I'm aware of. I'm pretty sure of that one. Okay. And one more question here. How common are the, the blue, all blue macaws? They come to drink the nectar at my silk floss. Um, the population of blue and yellow macaws were um, up to over 40 of them in Miami-Dade, but now it's down to probably less than a dozen. And I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll talk about why that is. Okay, great. Why don't we do this? Um, yeah, I see another couple of questions that I know that Brian's gonna be addressing. So what we'll do is we'll close this off for now. You can still put your questions in the chat and we'll get, we'll get to them at the end of the presentation and I'll allow Brian to move forward with the second part. Thank you for all the wonderful questions, everyone. Okay, thank you, Anna. Okay, moving, moving on now, we're going to talk about all of the exotic birds that are not parrots. So we'll start with Egyptian goose, which you can see is ABA countable. The Egyptian goose is found, its native range is in Sub-Saharan Africa. I've seen them in South Africa. Uh, its range barely extends into the Nile River Valley of Egypt, so why it became known as the Egyptian goose. I do not know. Maybe they were more common in Egypt uh, before um, Egypt became such a uh, populous country. They have become very populous, Egyptian geese that is, in South Florida. And uh, in the timeline, I'll explain how that all probably began. So you can see on the east coast of Florida, they're all over the place. I have them in my yard. They're not as common on the west coast of South Florida, and they really haven't been seen very often in the interior of, of Florida, so they don't seem to like the Everglades. Okay, everyone should know this bird. This is the Muscovy duck, also ABA countable. It's native to Mexico to all the way down into South America. 
and it's found in probably all of your backyards or neighborhoods. Another extremely common bird, and you'll be very surprised to find out how they got here in the first place. That's coming up soon. Indian peafowl, okay? This is a peacock, that's the male. If it was a female, it would be called a peahen. There are several species of peafowl, but the one that has been introduced to South Florida is the Indian peafowl. And as you probably have guessed by now, they're native to India and some other areas in uh, Southern Asia, inc including Sri Lanka. And here's where they can be found in South Florida. So I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, they can be found in places like Coconut Grove and South Miami, but they're also found in Broward and Palm Beach and over on the West Coast as well. Rock pigeon is actually an exotic. Many people don't know that. It's native to Europe, Asia, and also Northern Africa. And as you can imagine, any urbanized area has rock pigeons. So throughout South Florida. This is the Eurasian collared dove. This bird is also native to Europe, Asia, and uh, the coastal Northern Africa. And it's become very common in South Florida. In fact, uh, the first Eurasian collared doves uh, probably arrived here uh, from the Bahamas. They were introduced in the Bahamas and, um, and then they eventually spread into South Florida. And now they're found over much of North America all the way to Alaska. So over the course of just a couple of decades, uh, this species has spread throughout most of North America. This is gray-headed swamp hen. Used to be called purple swamp hen, but then it was split. So gray-headed swamp hen is specifically found in Southern Asia. It's actually found from Turkey all the way to Vietnam. And here in South Florida, in Miami-Dade, the most reliable place to see them is at the Dolphin Mall. So if you go to the Dolphin Mall and you walk to the retention ponds that are at the southern end of the mall complex, just wait a minute and a gray-headed swamp hen is probably going to pop into view. If you go into Broward and Palm Beach County, in a lot of the stormwater treatment areas, these birds have spread like wildfire. So there are hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of gray-headed swamp hens. And in my timeline, I'll give you an idea of where they came from and when, uh, when they arrived. Okay, here's red whiskered bulbul. This is the bird that Edith asked about. So this is another bird that's ABA countable. Its native range is Southern India, uh, Southern Asia. So uh, India and throughout Southeast Asia into China. In South Florida, really the only place that you can reliably see red whiskered bulbul is in the Kendall and Pinecrest area, probably down south, maybe to Palmetto Bay. Um, but they really haven't spread um, much further than that. There was a report a couple of weeks ago of a red whiskered bulbul that was found in Broward County. So that's the first report that I've ever seen from Broward County. So I don't know if somebody lost their pet red whiskered bulbul or if one of Miami's red whiskered bulbul decided to take a trip to Broward County. So time will tell if more red whis whis whiskered bulbuls will show up in Broward County. European starling. This is an ABA countable bird because its population has exploded since uh, it was introduced to North America. Its native range is um, similar to several of the other birds you've just seen, Europe, Asia, Northern Africa. And they are extremely common. They're found by the thousands and thousands um, throughout most of South Florida. More on that one later. 
This is the common minor, also ABA countable. It's been established in the last couple of decades. It's also uh, native to uh, Southern Asia. So India, Central Asia into Southeast Asia. In South Florida, uh, it's most common in Miami-Dade. It can also be found in the Keys. And they're off, they're sometimes seen in Broward County and Palm Beach County. They're sometimes seen in the interior around Lake Okeechobee. But as you can see, not very often in the uh, Naples, Fort Myers area. They haven't really um, done well, I guess, there. This is the other minor. This is common hill minor. Uh, this is a larger species of minor uh, and it's more arboreal. So it's found in trees while the common minor is more terrestrial. So you're more likely to see that one on the ground. So common minor is the bird that you see in shopping centers. Common hill minor, um, its native range is also Southeast uh, Asia. Um, into Borneo and Malaysia, Indonesia, also found in India. In South Florida, it was originally um, introduced in Palm Beach County, but apparently it's disappeared from Palm Beach and Broward County. And we thought for a while there that it had completely disappeared from Miami-Dade County. I used to see flocks of 20, 30, 40 of these birds around Matheson Hammock, Fairchild Gardens, South Miami area, but then they disappeared. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But in the last year or two, people are now reporting them again, but generally no more than one or two at a time. So this is a bird that um, hopefully it'll hang on here, but um, not so sure. Scaly-breasted munia, an ABA countable bird that is now established in Southern California. It's also established in the Western Panhandle of Florida, and it's here in South Florida. It's a beautiful bird, used to be called nutmeg mannequin. It's from Southeast Asia. I saw those in the Philippines last year. And in South Florida, Miami-Dade is probably the easiest place to find them in South Florida, but they have been reported in Broward, in um, the Naples area, and the Fort Myers area. House Sparrow, of course, everyone is familiar with House Sparrow, native to Europe, Asia, Northern Africa, found anywhere in urbanized South Florida. This is house finch. Now, this is the only species that I'm including in my presentation that is native to North America. So house finch is really native only to Western North America. And then it was introduced to Eastern North America uh, many decades ago. And it is st since spread throughout Eastern uh, the eastern United States, all the way down here into Florida. And in my timeline, I'll give you an idea of when they first arrived in Florida and when they first arrived in South Florida. So this is a bird that's much more common in um, Broward and probably in Palm Beach County than in Miami-Dade, but they're starting to become more common in certain parts of Miami-Dade County, like the Cutler Bay area where uh, they show up at feeders or around the falls, um, those um, neighborhoods there. Uh, I haven't seen any in Kendale Lakes, but it is probably just a matter of time before the species arrives and becomes pretty common everywhere in South Florida. This is spot-breasted oriole. This is another ABA countable species that's native to Western Mexico down into Central America, down to Costa Rica, a beautiful bird that the only place that it's found in, uh, in North America is um, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. So I have these in my yard and hopefully you do too. 
because they're a beautiful bird with a beautiful song. Okay, I want to talk a little bit. This I have a slide about extirpated exotics. The word extirpated means locally extinct. So that can happen even to exotic birds. So there have been a few exotic birds that have been introduced to South Florida, but their population never survived. They were breeding, but for whatever reason, the, the bird just didn't do well enough here for the population to maintain itself and they've disappeared. So one example of an extirpated exotic in South Florida is scarlet ibis. So scarlet ibis are native to South America. I've seen them in on the island of Trinidad, which is just off the coast of Venezuela. It's a beautiful bird. The way that they got to South Florida is in 1960, someone got the bright idea before there were laws against this kind of thing. Someone got the bright idea to smuggle some incubated scarlet ibis eggs that they collected from South America. They smuggled them into South Florida and they placed them in the nests of our native white ibis at Grenells Park, which is up in North Miami Beach. So at one time, there was a very large wading bird rookery in Grenells Park. Why that disappeared is another story for another time. But those scarlet ibis eggs were incubated by the white ibis. The eggs hatched, the scarlet ibis grew up and started spreading throughout South Florida. They eventually started to hybridize with the white ibis and we started seeing pink ibis for a while. But then all of those birds disappeared and now it's extremely rare that even the hybridized ibis are reported, reported here in South Florida. So if you wanna see this bird, you have to go to its native range to see it. Same thing with crested minor. This is another species of minor from Southeast Asia that was here in South Florida. They were also introduced to Vancouver, British Columbia, and a very large population persisted there for many, many years. The population in Miami was very, very small. They were breeding, but it didn't last, and they disappeared back in the 1970s or maybe the 1980s, the last time that they were seen. Same thing with blue-gray tanager. This is a beautiful tanager that's native to Central and Northern South America, was introduced to Miami. They started breeding, but it just didn't work out. And eventually they were extirpated. The species disappeared from South Florida. Same thing with Java sparrow. This is a species that's native to uh, Java and Bali in Indonesia. It's also been introduced to Hawaii and the population has done fine. If you go to Kapiolani Park in uh, Waikiki Beach in Oahu, you can see lots of Java sparrows just hopping around on the ground. They used to be here in Miami. They used to breed, but for whatever reason, they didn't last. So some species make it and some species don't. Um, and I'll talk about reasons why that may happen. Okay, so how did South Florida become so exotic rich? Why have there been so many different species uh, of exotic birds, birds from other parts of the world that have ended up here in South Florida? Well, as you can imagine, the pet trade has a lot to do with that. So during much of the 20th century, millions of birds, including over a million parrots, were imported into the United States. Now the Wild Bird Conservation Act of 1992 largely ended legal parrot imports, but there's still black market imports of some parrots. Many of the birds that were imported from the, pro the tropics were processed at local quarantine facilities right here in South Florida, particularly in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. And sometimes, while they were quarantines, some of the birds got out of their cages and they escaped. So that's how some of them ended up 
living here in South Florida. South Florida also has a thriving aviculture industry where people raise birds for the pet industry in cages or on their own property. And there's also numerous public and private bird collections. And for all of these um, sources of exotic birds, sometimes the birds escape from their cages and they end up out in the wild. We also have an affluent population here in South Florida that's able to afford very high priced species like these blue and yellow macaws and sometimes they get away from these people. We also have a large transient population, people that are moving back and forth between South Florida and maybe um, uh, the, the uh, New England or New York area. And sometimes they decide they don't wanna take their, their bird with them when they go back north. So they just end up releasing it out into the wild right here in South Florida. So that's how some of the birds have gotten here. We also have strong avicultural traditions in some of our ethnic communities. So some of our ethnic communities will keep birds in cages for um, singing competitions, and sometimes those birds escape. Now, why do they do well once they escape? Well, we have a year-round subtropical climate with numerous tropical storms. So that year-round subtropical climate is just perfect for most of these tropical birds. And then the numerous tropical storms are how some of these birds end up escaping because their cages get damaged during the tropical storm or the hurricane and the birds end up out in the wild. Also, the uh, exotic birds do well here because we have a large urban area that's a landscape with lots of exotic tropical plants that provide food sources for these exotics year round. So most of these exotics prefer exotic sources of food rather than our own native plants. So it's important to plant native plants for our native birds. The exotic birds are not eating for the most part our native plants. Though I have seen blue and yellow macaws eat pine cones from our native uh, Dade County pine. But for the most part exotics like to eat exotic food from exotic plants that are planted in a lot of backyards. So that's available to them year round. And also exotics can find supplemental food and water sources at thousands of backyard feeders and bird baths that uh, bird lovers in South Florida set up for them. So there are a multitude of reasons why we have so many exotics, but you can probably trace just about all of it back to pet trade. So all of this information, if you want more information about this, you can find that in that book, Florida Bird Species, an annotated list. Okay, here's my timeline that's going to give you an idea of when exotic birds found their way to Florida and South Florida. And we'll start with the rock pigeon which was introduced to North America way back in 1606. It was introduced first in Nova Scotia, and it was introduced actually as a food source rather than um, the reason why people keep uh, rock pigeons today as homing pigeons or racing pigeons. Um, so those original rock pigeons that were introduced to North America are probably not the source of the rock pigeons that we see today uh, out in the wild in South Florida and elsewhere in North America. It was, it's probably they were, they originated from the racing and homing pigeons that escaped from their owners and started breeding out in the wild. No one knows exactly when rock pigeons were first seen in Florida or South Florida, but it's probably over a hundred years ago. Same thing with house sparrows. House sparrows were introduced to the United States in 1860. By 1882, they arrived in Florida. And by 1930, they were seeing them here in Miami. Same thing with European starling. Introduced in New York City in 1890. Now, you may have heard a story about 
uh, European Starlings and William Shakespeare. That William, the European Starling is one of many birds that is mentioned in the works of William Shakespeare. And as the story goes, the organization that introduced European Starlings to New York City, it, it's often believed that they introduced them because they were mentioned in the works of Shakespeare. But there is a uh, bird historian uh, by the name of Rick Wright that has looked into the authenticity of that story and he can't find any evidence that there's a connection between the introduction of European starlings and William Shakespeare. So that may or may not be a myth. Anyway, by 1918, it arrived in Florida, and by 1953, it arrived in Miami, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Spot-breasted Oriole was first introduced uh, in Miami in 1948. They escaped from ca captivity, according to my resources, from some local tourist attraction, but it's not known, or at least it's not in print, what that specific tourist, tourist attraction is. By 1958, they had spread north into Palm Beach, but they've never spread any further than that. So they're still only found in Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. In 1960, red-whiskered bulbuls escaped from the Miami Rare Bird Farm on US-1. Apparently, the Miami Rare Bird Farm was located on US-1 around Southwest 104th Street, and they had an aviary with a big flock of red bulls, and they may have escaped during a hurricane, and they ended up um, breeding with each other, and they then spread throughout Kendall and Pinecrest, but they've never really spread beyond that. So that's the source of red whiskered bowls. Goes all the way back to 1960. Okay, Muscovy ducks. They were originally uh, imported into South Florida from Venezuela, and they were originally uh, introduced here as a bird for hunters. That was the original idea to introduce a species that hunters could go out and shoot. Well, I guess that didn't work out, but eventually, and they were originally introduced to the Fish Eating Creek area, which is on the western side of Lake Okeechobee. So, while they didn't work out as a species to be hunted, they did work out as a species to show up in our backyards. So they're attracted to the artificial lakes that are created in a lot of our subdivisions, and they're now everywhere. Common hill miner. This is the less common of our two miners. Uh, they were originally introduced in Palm Beach County. They later spread to South Miami-Dade, so they were introduced in 1968. They disappeared from everywhere except Miami-Dade, and as I mentioned before, they almost disappeared from Miami-Dade, but they still seem to be hanging on, but the population is very, very small. 1968 to 72, 700,000 white-winged and yellow chevron parakeets were imported into Florida, and many of them escaped during quarantine or during shipment, things like that. So that's probably the source of the white-winged and yellow chevron parakeets here in South Florida. The monk parakeets were first seen in the wild in South Florida in 1969, and then they've spread throughout Florida, and then separate introductions in other places in North America. 1982 is when the first common miners were seen in South Florida. They were first seen in Hialeah by a local bird guide, Larry Manfredi, is the first to report common miners, and that was back in 1982. In 1985, there are unconfirmed, this is a rumors, unconfirmed reports of the release of large flocks of orange wing parrots in Miami to avoid disease inspection. So apparently someone was trying to import um, orange wing parrots 
but they thought they wouldn't be able to get through the disease inspection. So the rumor is that they just release them out into the wild, and that's the source of our orange wing parakeets. Okay, this is a species that I haven't mentioned until now. This is the African sacred ibis. This is a species that was held in several uh, facilities, including um, a Zoo Miami, and they escaped during Hurricane Andrew. And they started showing up in the Everglades. And biologists started to get concerned that this species would be a problem for, other, uh, for our native ibis, our, particularly our white ibis. So uh, before the population got out of hand, they went into the uh, Everglades and they er started eradicating them. And the eradication was com complete by 2011. So now, as far as I know, there are no more African sacred ibis here in South Florida. But I used to see them in the Cutler Bay area when they were just flying around wild. The gray-headed swamp hens were first found in Pembroke Pines in 1996, and it was later determined that they had wandered away from local aviculturists. Apparently, these aviculturists in Pembroke Pines, they, uh, they didn't fence in their gray-headed swamp hens. Back then, they were called purple swamp hens. They just let, it, let them roam like free-range chickens. Well, the swamp hens, I guess, they weren't well fed enough. So they ended up wandering off into local marshes and they started breeding with each other and now they're spread like wildfire. Unlike with the African sacred ibis, the federal government just waited too long before the population was completely out of hand before they attempted to eradicate them. So they tried to eradicate them, but eradication efforts completely failed. Uh, as many as they killed, uh, it seemed that they were breeding faster than they can possibly eradicate them. So it's a lost cause. The gray-headed swamp hens are here to stay. Okay, what's the story with Egyptian geese? Well, in 1997, Egyptian geese, along with a lot of other species of exotic waterfowl, were introduced to Crandon Gardens. Most of the exotic waterfowl that were introduced there never made it, they never survived. Some people suspect that they were eaten by crocodiles. Only two species really survived the introduction to Crandon Gardens, the Indian peafowl and the Egyptian geese. But once the Egyptian geese started breeding, their offspring spring out. And now they've spread throughout much of Florida. So the population has expanded exponentially in the last 20 years or so. So it's not for certain that the first Egyptian geese came from Crandon Gardens, but it's a pretty good bet. Finally, the scaly-breasted munias. It wasn't until just 2006, just 14 years ago, that breeding was confirmed for this species. And uh, I saw some today here in Kendale Lakes. Uh, they're becoming more and more common and they're coming to a feeder near you. All right, are any, are any of these birds problematic? Are there any negative impacts of exotic birds? So. For most exotic birds, like for most of the parrots, studies have been done and it's never been shown that any of these parrots really have a negative impact on native bird species or a negative impact in any other way, except for one minor exception that I'll talk about in a minute with the monk parakeet. But um, for most of the parrots, they seem to have um, fit in very nicely, not negatively impacting any of the native birds at all. European starlings, on the other hand, have become a very prob big problem. They are very good at outcompeting native birds that are cavity nesters, such as woodpeckers, bluebirds, and swallows, including purple martins, 
for nest cavities. So the European starlings will go into the uh, nest cavity of a native bird. They'll kill the offspring, the babies of the native bird, and they'll throw them out. And then they'll build their own nest. So they're very, very aggressive. And they're very, very good at outcompeting the native birds. So they've become a big, big problem. For purple martins, it's a huge problem. Gray-headed swamp hens have become somewhat of a problem because they overgraze native plants like spike brush. They're, all, they're also a problem for rice um, farmers, such as in Palm Beach County, because they like to eat rice. So they go into rice fields and they damage the rice crops. So the gray-headed swamp hens have become problematic, and it's probably why the government tried to eradicate them, but they waited too long. As I said, monk parakeets can be a problem, but it's mostly for FPL. It, many of you may know that monk parakeets build very large communal stick nests. They're the only species of parrot that does this. All the other parrots are cavity nesters, but monk parakeets will build these large communal stick nests and oftentimes they build them on utility poles, on power poles, and sometimes they cause power outages. So it can sometimes become a problem for FPL. It's not a major problem, but sometimes FPL will remove the stick nest. Indian peafowl can be a problem because you know they'll stand in the middle of the road and become a traffic hazard. They're very noisy, especially during the breeding season. They can cause property damage. I've heard of Indian peafowl climbing up onto cars and scratching the paint. So there's a love-hate relationship with Indian peafowl here in South Florida. Some people love them, some people not so much. The Scovey ducks, again, there's a love-hate relationship. Uh, they leave their waste droppings everywhere. They destroy flower beds and other landscaping features. They can also be traffic hazards. Every time I get in my car, I have to make sure there aren't Muscovy ducks that are uh, around or even underneath my car before I leave because they're everywhere where I live. And finally, rock pigeons. Everyone knows about how rock pigeons can leave their waste droppings everywhere. And the waste droppings can actually do property damage. It can damage gutters other metal structures. It can even erode st stone buildings and burn lawns. And also their waste droppings can carry diseases such as histoplasmosis. So these are the, bird, the exotic birds that can be considered problematic. European starling is really the only one that's problematic for native birds. The others are problematic mostly for human beings. Okay, I was hoping to show you a video at this point in the presentation called Parrots in Peril, but because we're having some technical issues, we're gonna show the video at the end of the presentation. So this is a um, video that uh, features Daria Feinstein, who I mentioned before, that parrot advocate that has been trying to protect the wild parrots in Miami, in particular, the blue and yellow macaws. So blue and yellow macaws are very popular in the pet trade. Uh, they're a very expensive bird. So it's encouraged people to become poachers. So they use very horrible methods to capture these macaws. They use uh, night vision goggles. They use net guns. They even use uh, these uh, glue traps and the parrots will get stuck in the glue traps. Um, just awful ways to treat these beautiful birds. So um, Daria is, like I said, has become uh, Miami's number one advocate for these parrots. So when we show you this video, uh, I'll allow Daria to explain exactly why these parrots need protection and what you can do to help to protect them. Can 
Nope. Hold on. Okay. For more information about South Florida parrots, there's a really good book out called Parrots of South Florida. It probably needs to be updated. It's by Susan Epps. This is the second edition. So if you want a book that's just about the parrots of South Florida, this is the only good book that's available. Now, once you watch the video and Daria convinces you that you need to do something to help protect parrots, one of the places that you can go to for more information is uh, Parrots International. So their uh, website is at the bottom of their symbol. Uh, they protect parrots uh, all over the world uh, in their native range. And they even are concerned about parrots that are introduced to other parts of the world. So those parrots that are introduced to places like South Florida, South Texas, Southern California, they may be helping to save the native populations when those native populations are in trouble from poaching and, and uh, habitat loss and things like that. So uh, if you wanna support protecting parrots, Parrot International is where you should go. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, as in last month's presentation, if you want more information, um, you can connect with Tropical Audubon on social media. So these are all the ways that you can do so. So uh, if there are any other questions, Anna, I can take some more questions now. Yes, we do. <clears throat> we do have a bunch of really good questions. Um, I see one that just came up here. Where do we buy the Parrots of South Florida book? <clears throat> Amazon does not carry it. Um, I've seen it online. I thought it was still available at Amazon. Um, it, let's see where I've seen it. I think online is the only way that you're going to find it. Well, I'm hoping that it's not out of print. That would be a shame, but I'm not um, sure about that. Well, we can find out and in the email, follow-up email to all, um, to all attendees, we can hopefully put a link to where people can find that book. Okay. Uh, other questions? I've had a couple questions about parrot jungle and um, how many of these parrots that we see flying around may have come from parrot jungle. Well, if you talk to the people at parrot jungle, even when it was parrot jungle in uh, Pinecrest and now Jungle Island on, um, what is that island? Watson Island, uh, it, you know, near downtown Miami, they will claim that they've never lost a single bird from their facility. I have to take them at their word. We're assuming that most of the parrots that are now flying wild in South Florida probably got here as a result of escaped pets rather than from a facility like um, Parrot Jungle or Jungle Island. I mean, they're, they're parrots, that's their livelihood. So I'm sure they do uh, whatever they need to do to make sure that those birds stay healthy and uh, don't escape from their facility. Okay, thank you. Question, does the blue and yellow macaw have a predator? In the wild, um, harpy eagles probably will eat a bird as big as a blue and yellow macaw. Uh, here in South Florida, their only predator that I know of is us. Due to poaching. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. What is the difference between a vagrant and an accidental? Uh, same thing. The, those two words basically mean the same thing. Okay. Um, are there exotic species that are endangered in their native range but doing well here in South Florida? I didn't hear the first part of the question. Are there exotic species that are endangered in their native range but do well here in South Florida? I think the two uh, best examples of that that I know of are the two species that have been introduced to South Texas, the ones that have been become established in South Texas, and that's the red crown parrot 
and the green parakeet. Apparently those are not doing very well, especially the red crown parrot is not doing very well at all in its native range in Mexico. Uh, they're doing much better in uh, the introduced populations, especially uh, in South Texas, and even more especially in Southern California, where the, the population is very large now. Okay, um, a question from Jacob. Why did all the scarlet ibises disappear? It's really hard to say. Um, I, I guess that it, it appears that the, the scarlet ibis that hatched, the original scarlet ibis that hatched from the eggs, um, their, their breeding success, I guess, was very, very low. And they disappeared first. And before they disappeared completely, I think the remaining ones, that's when they started breeding with white ibis producing hybrids. And then, you know, because most hybrids are not, uh, they can't reproduce themselves. That's why the population disappeared. Okay. Uh, I have another question, which I believe you answered in your last slide, but just to double check. A question from Brooks. Because these exotic birds are non-native, they are not protected, how can we get the FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, to consider them non-invasive and get them protected under laws? The best way to do that is to write a letter to your um, local, state, and federal representatives and tell them that the FWC needs to take another look at um, the implications of not protecting some of the birds. I mean, certainly for birds like the red crown parrot and the green parakeet that may be disappearing from their native range, it's possible that the that birds from the introduced populations, uh, say in the Los Angeles area, can be captured and then reintroduced to their native range to try to save the native population. So there are benefits to having these non-native species that are not negatively impacting native species. It's maybe beneficial to have them here in places like South Florida, South Texas, Southern California, kind of as a bank for, to protect uh, those species from disappearing in their native range. But if they're not protected here, it's, it's not going to be an effective bank for if we need to reintroduce those parrots to their native range, uh, they may not be here to, to do that. Okay, thank you. I see on the chat, someone said, it looks like Books and Books might be able to order the parrots. Uh, you might be able to order the parrots of South Florida there. So Excellent. take a look into that and, and send that link in the follow-up email as well. I have a question on our live Facebook feed here. Um, this was also broadcast live on Facebook. Michael asks, after Hurricane Andrew, we had a hornbill in South Coral Gables, presumably escaped from the zoo. Have there been any sightings since then? There, I know there were some sightings in the years after Hurricane Andrew, but I'm not aware of recent sightings. Hornbills do live a long time, but uh, 1992 was a long time ago, so um, they, they almost certainly never bred in the wild. I don't think there was more than one. I could be wrong about that, but uh, I haven't heard of any reports of hornbills in many, many years. Okay, uh, another few more questions and then we'll watch the video. I have a question from Bruce. I used to have tons of Quakers and parakeets and all of a sudden they're, they're not coming anymore. What happened to them? What could have happened to them? Hmm, maybe FPL uh, took away their communal stick nests and they decided to nest somewhere else. 